Hello, Thrive Nation. I hope you Thrivers are doing really well, not just surviving in this crazy Corona coaster time, but thriving. And today I've got a special guest. He's a medical doctor and he's director of integrative hyperbaric, I think, medicine and health optimization medicine. I hope I got that right. He's a specialist Perfect. in hyperbaric oxygen therapy worldwide. He's done so many podcasts and he's a friend of one of my guests on the show, Boomer Anderson, another biohacker in Amsterdam, who we connected uh, through the Mate to Thrive show and had a really, really good time. And Boomer's been a great help to uh, my cause here in South Africa and Africa as Africa's number one pro biohacker. So I welcome to the show, Dr. Scott Schur. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Steve. It's nice to be here. Brilliant. And I'm so impressed about uh, how many podcasts you've done, how you've educated, and the community in South Africa knows and beyond, and we're growing internationally as well, which is really, really cool. That doctor comes from the Latin docere, which means to teach. And so you've been teaching health optimization medicine, as well as, you know, hyperbaric medicine for a long time. Tell mm -hmm. us how you got into it, what your backstory is, and why HBOT is getting so much momentum and so much press over the recent few months and pandemic. Well, again, thanks for having me, Steve. It's nice to be here. And it's, I think it's an interesting story for people to hear. You know, I didn't grow up like a conventional person, a conventional standard American diet focused kid because my father was a chiropractor. He still is. He's been a chiropractor for over 40 years. Wow. And I grew up in the frame of understanding health in a very different way than we typically will understand it from the conventional side. And I really enjoyed growing up in his practice. I was there when I was really young in his waiting room, talking to patients and playing with toys. And then I was behind the desk collecting money and doing the whole sort of business side of medicine and understanding the entrepreneurial piece of how to run a business and how many facets and just pieces of the puzzle there were that were always kind of happening behind the scenes. So he could just do what he did well and practice chiropractic. I decided to go to medical school though, because I realized that there were some limitations as to what the chiropractic license really allowed. And I also felt that there was likely a, a very significant need for the conventional to kind of be brought over to the integrative, or at that point it was just called alternative. There was no word like integrative medicine. That's not something that really existed until like maybe the last 10 or 15 years. And so I went to medical school. My goal going to medical school was to find a practice that I could use my alternative upbringing and understanding, and then kind of bridge the chasm between conventional and alternative medicine. And funny enough, I found this in a, a trauma center in Baltimore, where I trained in the basement where they had these large hyperbaric chambers. And I didn't really know what they were. I didn't know why people were using them, but I saw during some of my rotation, during a three-week rotation actually there where I was on call every three nights for 30 hours. So it's a pretty intense trauma rotation. You're seeing crazy stuff all the time. And but I did see a couple of patients with soft tissue injuries and also necrotizing fasciitis, which is a, a flesh eating bacteria is otherwise known in the lay press as, and, and as that it's a very severe infection, people can get their limbs, unfortunately infected and they have to be amputated and things like that. And I saw some patients going into the chamber and having these fantastically amazing results. They wouldn't have to get amputated or the amputations got significantly less than they would have if they hadn't gotten into the chamber. I saw patients with carbon monoxide poisoning uh, which it can be pretty severe. These patients were on ventilators and they were actually able to get the ventilator out while they were in the hyperbaric chamber and walk out of the chamber, which I'd never seen before anything like that in medicine. So I was really just, I think, enamored by the idea that all it really took was increased atmospheric pressure combined with increased inspired oxygen driven into the body to create this huge shift in physiology, both immediately and also over the long term through epigenetic changes that occur through these long-term protocols. And so I finished up my training in, as an internal medicine physician. And then um, I developed my training in hyperbaric medicine as a result of that initial interest when I was in medical school. And then over the, the years, and it's been about almost 10 years now that I've been involved in hyperbaric medicine, I really did create a practice that is what I call an integrative hyperbaric practice. It's not just about hyperbaric therapy, it's about what you're doing before, what you're doing during, what you're doing after. And then the, the before is oftentimes in the framework of some health focused optimal foundation, I call it. So in my world, that's health optimization medicine. In others, it might be something like functional medicine or 
looking at optimal, optimal terrain. It's basically the groundwork, you know, vitamins, minerals, nutrients, gut health, immune system health, hormonal health, circadian rhythms, uh, exposomics, the toxins in our environment, et cetera. And this is all related to the work of one of my mentors and colleagues, Dr. Ted Alchacoso, as Boomer probably spoke about on yeah. your podcast as well. Um, that's the framework that I use in my health-focused foundational practice. And then I use hyperbaric medicine as this fantastic accelerator, synergi synergizer, and optimizer of health. Fantastic. And uh, South Africa, in many ways, is advanced in terms of medicine, but in many ways, they're very uh, conservative. Uh, I'm going to share my screen because I really want to make this real for the for the audience and those on cool. YouTube. Um, so I'm gonna, I just want to show you in terms of, you know, what is actually being said now with regards to, uh, you know, South Africa. Uh, let's uh, go here and just share this. And uh, just going through this process, and uh, it looks like uh, I can't seem to share this advanced. But let me actually just then go to because it's not giving it to me easy. I'm going to tell you what uh, what's being said out there in certain websites uh, from the medical community, and um, speaking about mild hyperbaric oxygen therapy. And I do want to talk about the definitions and that but what's been said i'm not going to mention any names dr scott because i don't want to uh sort of put anyone under the bus or anything like that but uh sure. mild hyperbaric oxygen therapy is usually administered in inflatable soft chamber with air or air mixed with added oxygen these chambers prohibited by the american food and drug administration for use other than acute mountain sickness often do not comply with south african safety regulations Fabric chambers are not designed to be used with 100% oxygen. Oxygen in high concentrations increases the risk of fire. Cosmetics such as deodorant, hairspray, and makeup could easily combust under high oxygen content. Our team specifically investigates all these, and we know exactly what the safety rules and regulations are according to international standards. Some mild hyperbaric oxygen practitioners and marketers do not even have a fire extinguisher on site. So how can they advise on the correct fire extinguishing systems when they sell these chambers to the public as home devices? The increased atmospheric pressure in the hyperbaric chamber is another safety concern and a serious risk. If the soft chamber inadvertently deflates, as in the event of an unexpected power shortage, this could cause serious injury to a patient's eardrums or lungs. But in spite of warnings and recommendations from HBOT experts and bodies such as, the use of mild hyperbaric oxygen devices is on the rise. And former chiropractor Malcolm Hooper, who owns the Hyperbaric Treatment Clinic, Oximeter Australia, is to stand trial for unsafe practice following the death of a former client who was undergoing treatment for multiple sclerosis at Hooper's facility. So this is what's been said. I've avoided hyperbaric. I haven't been in a chamber. I haven't felt at ease to get it because I'm just not sure, you know, mm. the, the rules and regulations of hard chambers. And I do want to get some definitions on the different types of HBOT systems that there are. In my other life as a physician, I've used ozone for probably nine years, studied under Dr. Frank Schellenberger. I think it's an incredible Hello, treatment. Frank. And, mm -hmm. and many of the uses that I've, that I've used it in the practice, but it's under special guidance and a special treatment. What is HBOT and what are the different forms of HBOT, Dr. Sc Scott? Well, you gave me a lot to unpack there. <laughs> <laughs> a lot to unpack. I, I think the best place to start is to say that, well, just to address the mild units briefly, is that there are different levels of hyperbaric therapy. And levels, what I mean by that are pressures, how much pressure we're using. And then depending on the type of pressure that you're using, there are different types of chamber designs that allow you to get certain types of pressure. And typically mild units are chambers that go to milder pressures, typically what we call 1.3 to 1.5 atmospheres, which I'll define in a minute. And they are potentially able to be used at home. They're only FDA approved indication is acute mountain sickness. That is true. Um, but let's, st stopping there, let's go to the physiology and we'll talk about why we can still use them and that they, they can be very safe in a home environment if used appropriately. If they're used appropriately for the right conditions, of course, as well. 
and not use for conditions that they won't help. And that's really an important piece. And you mentioned in the beginning why I do a lot of podcasts. One of the reasons I do a decent amount of them is because more of these chambers are coming on the market. More people are interested in hyperbaric medicine and more, more people are, I feel like there's a huge need to educate on how to use these chambers most effectively. And so that's what I typically try to do. The, the definition is very simple. Hyperbaric therapy is a combination of increased inspired oxygen with increased atmospheric pressure. And increased atmospheric pressure, we're simulating the pressure you would feel under a certain amount of seawater. We all know that if you go underwater, water is heavy, it's gonna exert a pressure on you. The deeper that you go, the more pressure is exerted on your whole body. And that pressure is something we simulate in the chamber because if you combine pressure with increased inspired oxygen, more oxygen is gonna get driven into circulation. Now this oxygen is typically carried by red blood cells. Red blood cells typically carry oxygen from our lungs where they pick it up and then they bring it throughout the rest of the body where it needs to go through all your blood vessels, your art arteries, your arterioles, your arterioles, your capillaries, your venules, your veins, and back to your heart. Okay, that's the short story. And then it gets triaged where it needs to go depending on what you're doing. If you're exercising, if you're doing mental tasks, the blood will shunt more oxygen to those areas where you need it, okay? Now, there are ways to increase your red blood cell mass or density, the number of red blood cells you have in circulation. Those ways include things like altitude training. So hypoxic training will increase your number of red blood cells in circulation. Taking a drug called epigen will also do it. Epigen is a drug we use for renal failure, but it's also something that increases red blood cells. When the kidneys fail, you can't make red blood cells very easily anymore. So this is what cyclists like Lance Armstrong was famous for taking EPO and it's a very common drug. You can also give yourself red blood cells right before a race in the way of a transfusion. And then that also will increase your red, your red blood cell mass and your oxygen carrying capacity. In a chamber, what we're doing is actually, if there are sites on your red blood cells that can still take more oxygen, then those will bind. But the rest of it is actually related to how much oxygen is getting driven into the plasma or the liquid of your blood. Hyperbaric therapy, the pressure drives that oxygen into the liquid of your blood, the plasma. And it does it in a much higher quantity than it can be done at sea level. And it's that liquid oxygen that's free floating in there that creates an oxygen diffusion potential throughout the whole body to create the stimulus where more oxygen is getting to cells. And as a result of more oxygen getting to cells, more energy is being produced. More oxygen getting to cells is also creating oxidative stress. And this stress also helps with a lot of the epigenetic uh, epigenetic changes that happen over a long period of hyperbaric therapy in a protocol, for example. So often I, I like to delineate between what is happening acutely when you get into the chamber and what is happening after a long-term protocol or a uh, oxygen infusion protocol, as I like to call it. And immediately what's happening is you have all that oxygen getting in circulation. You have a couple of things that are happening. You have what's initially what, what can happen is mild vasoconstriction. Your blood vessels actually constrict down a little bit. That's good if you've had an injury or if you have sw swelling, for example, it's going to decrease swelling. It's going to decrease uh, as a result of decreasing the size of the vessel. You're going to have less stuff leaking out of the vessel and less inflammation and all the, the bad stuff that can happen to tissue beds when blood vessels are damaged. The second thing that happens is that you have, um, you have also the stimulus where you have re reversing low oxygen state, right? And we talked about that with increasing oxygen in circulation. So if you've had an acute heart attack, acute stroke, acute, acute traumatic brain injury, a spinal cord injury, all of these things, acute trauma to a limb, which is what I've seen when I, when I was training, for example, you can see how hyperbaric therapy can help you save that body part or organ because you can get oxygen to tissue that's potentially at risk for dying. And also mitigate something called reperfusion injury, which is when blood gets re- uh, gets uh, the blood starts re uh, going back into tissue again and after an injury, for example. And then there's also the immediate oxygen stimulus, so helping with potentially bugs that do, that do not like high oxygen environments. Uh, there's also increased immune system function where you have all the early cells of the white blood cell category, the neutrophils, the macrophages, and those that are starting to go to tissue to start helping with uh, with the starting of the immune system process and cleaning up and help regenerate and heal that area. So it's like the first stages of wound healing, I would call it. I'm just going to stop the, you there. Yeah. Is, it, is yeah. this for ATAs of two and above the heart chambers as well as the mild? Is this happening both? Because you've said a lot of benefits yeah. and the person out there might be saying, do I have to go to a hospital and have this in a heart chamber? Or is this happening with mild hyperbaric oxygen therapy? So it depends. The, for the mild chambers, we think that most of what I've just discussed is happening in neurologic tissue only. 
the we brain think. essential. We think, yes. The brain and neurologic tissue only. I mean, we have studies that show hyperbaric therapy at the mild pressures between 1.3 and 1.5, helping for things like traumatic brain injury and stroke and cerebral palsy and autistic spectrum disorder and multiple sclerosis. And so there are there is work that's been done in research around the world that shows that these mild pressures can potentially help in those scenarios. And so we don't have a lot of evidence that it happened that it helps outside of the central nervous system. Um, so for the for the peripheral nervous system, the the systemic everything else outside of the of the, the brain and the spinal cord, we are talking about most of the studies being done at the deeper pressures in the medical grade chambers that go to pressures that are typically at two atmospheres or below, which is the equivalent of 33 feet of seawater or deeper in general. Uh, most of the studies that have been done on longevity and things like that have been done at the 2.0 atmosphere range. Now, you have all these things that are happening immediately. Like I was saying, the only other things that I didn't say were that there's a stem cell release. So stem cells get released both from your bone marrow and they mature in your the tissues where they are housed. This includes in the brain, we have we have some evidence that neural stem cells do get uh, mature do mature inside of a hyperbaric environment, along with systemic, and then there's also the the pressure itself, which we believe is happening in a a structured water kind of way, where that we think that hyperbaric therapy is creating more structured water on the cellular level, and then helping with flow both in blood vessels and lymphatics, and then. The long-term protocols of hyperbaric therapy, whether it be the brain or systemically, depending on the type of chamber, what you're seeing is these epigenetic shifts and how genes are being expressed. Genes that are responsible for, in, for inflammation get downregulated. Gen, gen, genes are responsible for programmed cell, cell death or apoptosis get downregulated. Uh, genes that are responsible for growth and for healing in general get upregulated. So these are the ones that help with blood vessel growth, uh, connective tissue growth. Um, and the stem cells that have, were initially released now start getting matured into all these other cells or these types of tissue that we want. So I like to call it sort of like a scaffold builder, the hyperbaric environment, where you have all these things that are happening that recreate or re regenerate the tissue beds that have been injured, degenerated, uh, that have been infected or whatever. Okay, great. So there's a lot there. In essence, it helps a lot of the systems. It's not a silver bullet. It's, uh, as you said, you use it as a a complementary treatment on its own, it's going to have its limits. And that's why you want to do health optimization medicine. Although at your clinic, you've got a heart chamber at two ATAs, and maybe you want to just define what an ATA is and what sure. the different levels are. You've got a heart chamber, and I'm assuming you've got soft chambers. You've worked with both. So after mm -hmm. many, many years in the game, you'd be able to say, listen, is it worthwhile for the listener or the viewer out there to go and invest the thousands of rands or dollars in this treatment, whether it's mild hyperbaric or is it better for them to invest in the, the deeper sort of more pressurized, uh, uh, you know, numbers to get a better benefit? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, to say first, I do think that for acute indications, for things that cause immediate damage, hyperbaric therapy can be a huge game changer without almost doing anything else. It's really amazing what I've seen in necrotizing fasciitis and in, in burns in also in patients with acute traumatic brain injuries, actually. And there was a study that was done where they did usual care and they added hyperbaric therapy and there was a 50% decrease in mortality. And so they're coming out with a phase three study, hopefully this year, if not next year, to show, uh, we hope that, that, that that's the case. So I do think that you know it can be a quote unquote silver bullet in acute indications where you have acute trauma, acute, injury and when you can get into the chamber you can see massive shifts okay but when it comes to more long-term goals or chronic indications whether it be you want to live to 175 or you have a chronic post-concussive syndrome or if you have chronic Lyme disease etc then it really does require that foundation and that's where health optimization looking at that ground game health optimization medicine or home for short is what we really do and what we're trying to bring to the world as a nonprofit, actually that other doctors and practitioners can get educated and trained in so they can use it in their own practices. Now to ask, answer your question about ATA and, meta, and types of different chambers, what often happens is that when people come to me and they ask questions about whatever is going on, then it, it starts to become, my, then, it, then I bring it into my framework, right? My framework is, okay, is hyperbaric therapy appropriate potentially for this condition? Is hyperbaric therapy appropriate now or later? Is it appropriate to do stuff before? What are we gonna do during? And what are we gonna do after to help it make it work better? 
and then what type of chamber would be most effective for their particular condition. And what I've noticed over the years is that there is a little bit of gray area when it comes to performance. Because if you're doing performance biohacking types of things and you're relatively healthy, the mild chambers can actually go a long way if you're using other technologies at the same time. And so if you're getting into hyperbaric chamber, you're using infrared saunas, you're using low level light therapy, you're doing body work, you're doing yoga, you're doing you know, cold baths, you're doing you know, fill in the blank of your biohacking technologies, then oftentimes what I've seen is that these, pay, these people that can do very well in the mild units for even muscle recovery and jet lag and, and, uh, and cognitive performance, of course, and immune system health. And, I, and I've seen that. And we're, we're actually seeing some fantastic things now in the, in the worlds of pandemics and things, which you know, obviously I'm not gonna make any claims because we don't have any research yet, but we're seeing that hyperbaric therapy can help with even pulmonary inflammation, even at the mild doses. And so when it comes to the performance end, I've seen significant benefits in the mild chambers. However, if there are systemic things that we really want to do, if we're really, really looking to regenerate blood vessels, if we're looking to, uh, if we're really doing like anti-aging work, if we're looking at you know significant conditions that require systemic therapy, like 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 most chronic infections or, uh, or chronic pain syndromes, for example, or if we're doing fertility work, uh, there's so many options. Pre post surgery, others. If they come in with what I feel is more of a systemic indication, then what I'll often do if, if I have that available is, is recommend they go into a hard or medical grade chamber. And there are a couple different varieties that we talked about, the mild chambers. There are also hybrid chambers that are sort of mild and hard. And then there are medical grade chambers that go typically two atmospheres and deeper. And the two atmosphere marker is the equivalent of 33 feet of seawater when if you could imagine you were diving down 33 feet below the sea, you looked up, all that water above you is exerting a pressure. That's the pressure that we simulate in a hyperbaric environment. So what it comes down to is that the mild chambers typically go to between 1.3 and 1.5. The hybrid chambers will go from 1.3 to 2.0 typically. And then the medical grade chambers will go from any chamber, go 1.3 down to three atmospheres typically. Three atmospheres is 66 feet of seawater. It's an interesting number because that's where there's been studies that have shown that you no longer need red blood cells in circulation to actually maintain your physiologic function. So you can saturate so much oxygen in circulation that you no longer need red blood cells. Now there's some downsides to that, which we can talk about later, but in general, that's how much oxygen we can get in. I hope that's helpful. Yeah, very helpful. And I think just take us through the process, you know, if someone's going to go and do it in South Africa in a mild hyperbaric, you know, unit, do they put a mask on? Should they, I mean, their claims it's 90% oxygen, should it be 100%? You know, I've got a couple yeah, of websites, about that. Yeah, you sure, know, yeah. I've got a, I've got a couple of websites here where they say it's 90%. I'm not going to mention any names here, obviously, but uh, there are different percentages yeah. of people putting masks on. Sometimes I see, you know, on websites, there's no mask. They're in a unit without a mask. Right. Do, you know, right. just tell us about the, in, you know, the, sure. the user who's so, going to do that. Yeah. yeah, that's a great, it's a really great question, Steve. I mean, so what happens is uh, you are, there's a couple of different ways this can work. You can go into a chamber and the chamber can be pressurized with 100% oxygen or it can be pressurized with the air that's at sea level, okay? And so when you're pressurizing with 100% oxygen, that can only be done in a medical grade chamber in a supervised facility because that's, it is dangerous and absolutely no mild chamber should ever have 100% oxygen in it because they're not made for that, okay? Now, what can happen is if you don't have 100% oxygen in the chamber is that you have a couple different options. The first option is that you can just pressurize the chamber itself without any extra oxygen. When you do that and you pressurize a hyperbaric environment, say it's a 1.3 atmosphere chamber with air, what's going to happen is that the density of the air gets thicker, okay? There's still 21% oxygen in the air, but you actually get more oxygen into circulation. So by just breathing the, level, the air that's in your chamber, that was sea level air and now pressurized, you're getting about 46% more oxygen in circulation without any more oxygen that you're breathing. Now, what will happen is that you can get oxygen additionally in a, in a couple different ways. You can get it by face mask, you can get it by nasal cannula, you can get it by hood. And 
It depends on the type of chamber that you're going to be using. Typically for mild units, they're gonna be using either a face mask or a nasal cannula, and they're going to be using an oxygen concentrator, which is outside the chamber, and pumping oxygen into the chamber through the nasal cannula or through the mask. Now, you should never be in a chamber where the oxygen is just allowed to just kind of spray everywhere while you're in the chamber. It should be something that you're getting on your face, nasal cannula, or better off a mask, because that's gonna keep it more contained. You wanna keep the environment of a mild chamber or even a, a medical grade chamber that's not set up to be 100% oxygen. You don't want that oxygen level to be above about 21 or 22% inside the chamber. And so most, unfortunately, you know, most chambers don't test for these kinds of things in the sense of is if you were, um, as far as the flow rates out, out of the chamber once you get in them. Because basically what happens is the chamber gets pressurized and then as the pressure gets to the pressure that you want it to be at or that it's made for, then you have release valves that release the pressure so it maintains at that pressure. And so you don't know what those release rates are going to be and things. So it's, it's really important that if you're gonna get oxygen in the chamber, you do like a face mask or a nasal cannula. Face mask is better because it's gonna keep it more contained. And as far as how much oxygen is getting in there, that's also, it's interesting because people don't really understand this. I mean, obviously coming out of a, an oxygen concentrator, typically you're gonna have about 90 to 95% oxygen coming out of it, okay? And so then, then it's getting pumped in at 10 liters a minute, but it has to get through the pressure of being in a hyperbaric environment. So by the time it actually gets to you, it's probably about five liters a minute at 1.3, okay? And so at five liters per minute at 90% oxygen, you are probably increasing your, your what we call your FiO2, your fractional, inspiration of oxygen from about 21% to maybe about 35 to 40% tops. And so you're not breathing 90% and you're not getting 90% oxygen. It's just not happening. And that only happens if you have very, very high flow rates and hoods on your head. And we do that in deeper pressures. When you're going to a medical grade chamber that you're going to two atmospheres, that's when you use like either a 100% non-rebreather mask uh, which you've maybe seen in the past, or you can put a hood on them so they have like something on their neck that they're wearing, and then that seals them so they're getting 100% oxygen in there. And so those are the only ways you can get to 100% oxygen is 100% non-rebreather, uh, a hood, or 100% oxygen in the the circular in the chamber itself. And then a lot of it depends on the flow rates as well. So in general, the mild chambers are either going to have no extra oxygen or they're going to have an oxygen concentrator, and in either case, there are benefits, but those are the, the basic ways to delineate. So now, I mean, I've looked at so many websites abroad. No one's speaking about flow rates. I mean, this is something new. This right. is why I wanted to have you on. I've got another one. This 430 chamber is a soft chamber that goes to a maximum of a 1.4 ATA and uses 90% oxygen enriched air from an oxygen concentrator. Uh, so if no one's mentioning flow rates, and no one's measuring it. It's like we start wondering exactly what's going on. I just know from my other life, we know exactly what the flow rate that comes out of sort of the oxygen like uh, a regulator. We know exactly what number to put it on. We know exactly the gamma that's coming out when you're going to be using this, this ozone, these three oxygen molecules. Why is this flow rate not being measured? And obviously it makes a big difference, you know, if someone's getting 90% oxygen or they're getting 50% oxygen through the mask. I mean, this seems like a very, very important factor. It is, it is. And it's important to talk about flow rates. Now we're talking about the oxygen flow rates here, just to be clear. We're not talking yeah. about the pressure flow rates, but we do know that increasing the amount of oxygen, even a little bit is going to increase the amount of oxygen circulation. So we don't know, in general, we, we see basic ranges of how much oxygen is increasing, but it's not going to be, the 90% oxygen that's coming from your concentrator is not going to uh, translate to 90% oxygen that you're breathing. It's just not the way it happens. And so, but even increasing your, 20, your FiO2 from 21% to 35% is a significant increase. And it will help for the reasons that we've discussed so far. Now, had they looked at every single pressure and every single oxygen concentrated in flow rate? No, but I have seen over the years that I've practicing this, that over time, you need less oxygen oftentimes to get the same benefits as well, because the body goes through that epigenetic shift. And in some patients, we don't, in some patients, I don't even have them using any oxygen at all, except for what's pressurized in the air over long-term maintenance. But you're right, there is significant delineation, the significant uh, gray in the sense of how, how much exactly you're getting. 
And it's very difficult to measure. It'd be very difficult to measure in a chamber exactly how much you're getting. So what should you look for? Because I mean, you're looking for bang for your buck and you know, at Matrix Drive, we want to always optimize people's time and energy. There's only so mm-hmm. much finance. There's only so many things that they can do. You know, this continuum of functional medicine and integrative sure. medicine, there are so many modalities. You know, what are people going to look for in terms of flow rate or the oxygen chamber if they're going to be doing mild hyperbaric oxygen therapy? Or should they just go to a medical doctor and get into a heart chamber and rather spend the money at a 280 and get 100% oxygen, which is a far safer option in many ways, but might be unaffordable for them. I just think it depends on the indication, honestly, Steve. I mean, because if they have an indication that would really benefit from hard chamber hyperbaric therapy that goes to deeper pressures, then absolutely that's what they should do. If they have more of a, uh, they have more of a, they're more concerned about optimal performance and they're doing things more like in the biohacking sort of way. I've really seen amazing things for people that have done the chambers in more of an integrative way. I've also seen really great benefits for patients with central nervous system related issues and and spinal cord related issues. Although not not talking about like paralysis or anything like that. I'm talking about maybe like things like MS for example, but not, uh, but I would say that what's nice about the mild chambers is that they're, they're very, at least the ones that I work with, I can't speak for every hyperbaric chamber in the world because I simply don't know, but I am very clear about the ones that I work with and making sure that they're safe and that they've been tested in the ways that I feel that are appropriate. Now in the US, there are uh, several different brands that have FDA clearance, which means that they've gone through the FDA process and gotten a clearance. There's others that uh, that are used across the world that have their own designations that I'm, that I'm aware of as well. And so I work with those companies mostly if I'm going to be using the mild chambers to make sure that you know what you're getting. The challenge is that you know, there's so many chamber companies out there and you don't know what you're getting. And that, that is a certain, certainly a, diff, a difficulty. And so one of the things that I, I've been trying to do over the last several years is, is bring more attention to all of this, but also bring some education to the soft chamber companies because the challenge is that these guys unfortunately think that they can do every, that people can do anything in those chambers that you can do in a hard chamber. And that's just not true. Yeah. One of the things that they will tell you is that, um, and I don't feel, there's no evidence to this, is that, that you can do more treatments in a mild chamber and that'll be the equivalent to doing less treatments in a hard chamber. Um, and that may be true for neurologic indications. That may be true for, an, for milder pressures when you're going to 1.3 to 1.5, but I certainly do not feel it's true at all if you're doing it more for a systemic indication. You know, I don't put in patients that have had chronic infections most of the time because chronic infections, especially Lyme disease, can get worse in a mild environment. If patients have obviously any of the in- insurance indications, so the insurance approved indications in the US, always in the hard chamber, except for the acute mountain, mountain sickness one. And so I'm, I'm always very, I think, emphatic in the sense that um, that people should be using the chamber that's most appropriate for them. And then also vetting the chambers that they're using and the people that are using them to understand uh, the safety, like nobody should be in a chamber with, with 100% oxygen if you have a mild chamber. You just shouldn't be doing that. They shouldn't be blowing oxygen in the chamber in, in, instead of using a mask or a nasal cannula. That's just not safe to do. Uh, another thing that's happening a lot recently is that you're seeing hydrogen get thrown into some of these chambers as well. And I don't feel like that's a great idea either, either because hydrogen and, and oxygen are both flammable gases. And so uh, there might be a role for hydrogen in patients that have significant pulmonary, uh, potentially and especially um, pulmonary toxicity or, or oxidative stress in the lungs, but I don't think it should be done inside the chamber. Uh, there's one company that is actually using that they're taking out the nitrogen in the chambers and just putting in hydrogen and oxygen. I think that's a bad idea. Okay. And so, and so I think it's, it's, if it's, uh, that's why it's important to vet all this stuff out. And that's why I only work with companies that have vetted this out and that it's important to know where your chamber is coming from and who's running it and, and, and have a good feel for the whole process. Brilliant. I started really investigating HBOT because of Dr. Daniel Amen's work and uh, reading sure. his book, uh, The End of Mental Illness, which was uh, it was incredible. I've known his work for a long time, but he made some huge statements and some huge claims in that book, you know, with uh, neurological issues and obviously looking at his scans, the spec scans. Tell us about how important is, you know, HBOT with neurological issues, especially like things like autism. You know, I interviewed Dr. Stephanie Seneff and what's happening with autism in the States and how it's sort of progressing in New Jersey. She made a statement last year, one in 20 boys 
is born on the ASD spectrum since the 1950s has gone from one in 30,000 or 35,000 to one in 26 across. There's some significant problems with glyphosate causing some epigenetic changes as well as genetic changes and replacing glycine as a protein. A really concern, I was, I was blown away, started really studying and looking at what's happening with ADHD and all these mm -hmm. neurological issues. Where does HBOT fit in? Dr. Ayman is a huge proponent of HBOT. And where do you see it with our future children? That's a good question. Uh, and you're right, I'm, I'm just as worried about all this as everybody else that knows about it. For me, the first thing that often happens is that when they come to me and, they, and people ask if they should get a spec scan, or they should go to the Yemen clinic. It depends on where they're, why they're coming to see me. In the sense, if they come from a, from a if they've had a traumatic brain injury, for example, and we know why they've had an injury and we know why they've presented the way they have, then I don't feel like there's often a lot of additional information that can be attained in the sense that we know they have a brain injury. That's what we're addressing. It's not going to change how we really do our work. Now, would it be nice to have a before and after? Sure, but it costs money. And so is it really that important? Now, for people that are more on the neurologic, neurologic spectrum that you've just described, it's, it's a much more helpful tool, I think, especially when you're combining it with some sort of foundational assessment. And Dr. Eamon has his own way that he does his work with people. I'm sure Stephanie does as well and others, but the idea really is, is to look at things more in a foundational way. Now, hyperbaric therapy and these other neurologic indications, whether it be on the autistic spectrum, ADHD, et cetera, they are a synergistic tool, but they are not a primary treatment in, their, in themselves. I have seen over the years significant benefit, especially in the, on the ASD side of things. If they are, if these kids are also being uh, done, they're being looked at more in a, in a holistic way. They're looking at their diet, they're looking at their lifestyle, they're, they're, doing, they're doing the whole thing. It's not just about getting the chamber. In fact, if people come to see me or they, they, they call me and they say, hey, Dr. Scott, let, I wanna get my child in for autism. And I say, well, what else are you doing? Like, we aren't, you know, we're not doing anything else. Well, maybe they've worked on their diet a little bit. Like, just don't waste your time or your money right now. Do the therapy when you're also getting involved in the integrative side of the functional side and working on that as well. What I think is happening in the chamber, although I don't have evidence of this, is that I think what we see sometimes, so we've seen this in PTSD in patients that don't have traumatic brain injuries. PTSD can look like a traumatic brain injury on a spec scan, even though you've, and it can look like you've had a brain injury, but you just have PTSD. You've never had a brain injury, for example. And what I think happens and how these people get better in the chamber is that I think it's like exercise for your blood vessels. If you're exercising this microcirculation with pressure, you can help with auto-regulation or regulation of blood flow to various areas of the brain. I mean, I don't know this for sure, but we think that that's, I think that's probably what's happening along with helping with flow, cerebral spinal fluid flow, lymphatic flow, especially if you're combining it with things like chiropractic and osteopathic care and acupuncture, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not in a silo. Hyperbaric therapy is certainly only a, an additional therapy uh, for these kinds of people uh, and kids and not the primary one. Great. I do want to talk about oxidative stress. I want to give you a little bit of backstory on my medical history. 23 years, I've never missed a day's work at the office. Haven't been sick or used Western medicine in over 25 years. Have fought every single type of virus that my patients over the years have, have brought in. Now, in that case, when I've done my blood work and done the whole functional medicine, I show significant amount of oxidative stress. Things like GGT, really, really high. Things like oxidized LDL, a significant problem. Having said that, having trained six days a week, sometimes seven days a week, I've run a Comrades Marathon. It's a 56-mile race every single year for the last 11 sure. years. 35,000 sure. kilometers on the road. A lot of anaerobic exercise. I love my exercise. It's the most important thing in terms of my well-being. 35,000? 35,000 kilometers in the last 25 years. It's my space. Okay. It's my mental space. It's my meditation. I do a thing called chi sure. running where I get into the zone. It's so crucial for me. And uh, after 21 years of marriage, Dr. Scott and two children, my wife now kicks me out of the bed when I need to go and exercise because she just knows, she knows. how important yes. it is for me. It's just my game changer. Now, with that oxidative problem that I've had, and I am working on those things, 
things like hormetic stresses of infrared sauna, which I'm in six days a week. I, 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 photobiomodulation has changed my life, but then I'm doing fasting, which is another hormetic stress. I'm doing, you know, cold thermogenesis, another hormetic stress. Now I'm adding another hormetic stress in terms of HBOT. Tell me the oxidative stress that can happen from all these modalities or these biohacking modalities. And I think it can possibly cause more damage than good in the long term. What are your thoughts on this hormetic stress? Well, it sounds like you have a lot of hormetic stress in your life. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my, my, one person, my one piece of advice for, for, for you would be, well, two would be, well, can I curse? Yeah, you can curse. You yeah. can curse. Fucking recover, man. Recover. <laughs> like you have to, I mean, and recovery is such a big challenge for people like yourself who are so on, on, on all the time and don't know how to, re how to relax as easily. They relax when they're doing their on, mm. like you talked about. You do your chi running, you do your meditations when you're running, but you're still on when you're doing those things and creating. And, and so I've seen that over the years that people do die early because of oxidative stress and all the things that they're doing because they're not giving them time to recover. And when somebody's going to a hyperbaric environment, I consider what their, if I can, I test what their oxidative stress levels look like before we get into the chamber. What are their optimized levels of vitamins, minerals, and nutrients? Do they have cofactors? Do they have, are they toxic? These will be very helpful because what we're doing in the chamber is we're creating a stimulus to make more energy. And when you're making more energy, you're gonna make more waste products of energy metabolism, and that includes oxidative stress. So there was a study done by a colleague of mine, his name is Dr. Dom Diagostino. I'm sure you've heard his name. Yeah. And Dom did a study with, it was more of like a review paper. It's one of my favorite papers, I can send it to you. And it, it talks about how after about three hyperbaric sessions, the oxidative load that we've created is balanced by an antioxidant surge that occurs as a result of that hormetic stress. And so after about treatment three, you actually have more antioxidant capacity than you have oxidative load. And so over a long period of time, and that's what we typically see is that we don't see oxidative stress. We see actually balanced oxidative load with the antioxidant surge that's occurred as a result of hyperbaric therapy. But that of course makes, it's actually, of course, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It, it depends on what you have going on, ahead of going on it. And it, so you have to know what your state of oxidative load is before you go in. So I have had people over the years where they've gotten worse in the chamber because they have so much oxidative stress and you're not supporting them. I've had patients that I've known that they have a lot of oxidative stress, so we address that. So in patients that have severe infections, chronic autoimmune problems, uh, like Lyme disease is a great example. Sometimes we'll give antioxidants while they're getting into the chamber, just knowing that we're doing, we're just trying to help them and mitigate some of that stress while they're getting in and getting the hyperbaric treatment. Now, the, uh, the, level, the level of oxidative stress will increase the amount of oxygen and the amount of pressure that you're giving. So mild units will only cause mild amounts of oxidative stress. In fact, the probably the only oxidative stress that it's happen that's happening is likely in the brain and the central nervous system, not really centrally very or outside the central nervous system very much. As you go deeper into the medical grade two atmospheres and below, you're going to get not only oxidative stress in the brain, you're going to get oxidative stress in the body. And that's like you said, it's a hormetic stress and it does help the body heal itself. And that hormetic stress is what changes your epigenetics and, and does everything that we were discussing before. But oxidative stress is, it's, it shouldn't be looked at in a vacuum. It really needs to be looked at in an integrative way. What is causing the oxidative stress? How do you address the oxidative stress? Are you recovering? Steve, are you recovering? <laughs> so, I am, I and, am. You yeah. know, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not getting good. injured. But, but the thing is, is if we look at these, let's, let's dive into the weeds. What would be your top markers? You know, obviously is the HSCRP, you know, this oxidized LDL, I mean, looking at liver, liver enzymes, which I've had an uh, issue in the past, sorted that out with my GTT, mm -hmm. all my ALTs and, and, and just the liver enzymes that are involved. Tell us mm -hmm. your top maybe four or five markers of oxidative stress, because, you know, the people that I do see from a biohacking point of view, they want to maximize their sleep. They want to optimize their health and their performance. You know, they're watching their HRV. They've got a good indication of their data, you know, or, mm -hmm. organic acid tests, amino acid tests, looking at these processes. Tell us your top markers for oxidative stress. So I use urine and blood markers. I typically yeah. use urine, urine organic acids and then like, like, and then also the blood markers as well. So thinking, looking at like vitamin C levels and looking at alpha lipoic acid levels, using a combination of, of these tests, typically looking at, um, looking at glutathione levels, of course, uh, looking at 
uh, what else? Uh, I'm looking at levels of minerals, of course, like selenium, et cetera. And so I'm, I'm looking at a whole panel of things to look at oxidative stress, typically. And so it's not just one marker, it's looking at the combination of various markers that give you a sense of how things are working. You can look at mitochondrial function, you can look at organic acids and mitochondrial function, you can look at all the intermediates of the citric acid cycle, and you can get a pretty good sense quickly uh, what's happening from an oxidative stress perspective. You know, do they need, do you need more CoQ10 or alpha lipoic acid? Are your B vitamins in the tank for more likely? If, if that's the case, then you have significant uh, need for obviously B vitamins, but also oxidative, oxidative stress support, excuse me. So let's look at all these things together. And that's what we do in health optimization medicine. We're looking at all these metabolites and the metabolome, you know, metabolomics together to get a better sense. And you can also get a sense by looking at the GI profile, looking at stool and looking at you know, metabolic health there, di digestive quality, malabsorption, leaky gut, all those kinds of things. And those all play a part in it as well. Correct. And maybe I should get a perspective from you when we, uh, we finish the podcast, because I think that uh, just having another set of eyes looking at it, it would be really, I think, helpful. But tell me about the dangers of HBOT, you know, what can go wrong, what people should, you know, be wary of signs. I mean, we've had these in other areas, you know, ozone, just watching, you know, certain signs of too much ozone or reactions to ozone. What should people be aware of going into, uh, you know, a series of treatments? Because I think what uh, the, the listener needs to know, just going for one treatment in a mild hyperbaric chamber is probably going to not do much. Uh, no, you need won't. a series yeah. of treatments, but what should you watch out for? Because there is a, you know, there's a concern and, and I think there's all benefits from these mild hyperbaric chambers of sort of a housewife or, you know, that's probably not uh, correct terminology, but a, a house person, you know, running a mild hyperbaric uh, chamber in their house on the side, trying to increase income, you know, what should people be aware of? Yeah. I'm not going to use that same terminology, <laughs> but it's, I mean, it's really an important question. And so the biggest thing that people feel when they go into a hyperbaric environment is their pressure changing in their ears. So that same feeling you have, if you were on a plane or a train, or if you were a scuba diver or snorkeler, free diver, Australians, I have friends that are free divers in Australia. Mm -hmm. So you have that pressure sensation in your ears. If you have trouble with that outside of a hyperbaric environment, inside a hyperbaric environment, it's probably going to be difficult as well. That's the number one thing that always is important because that is normal. The pressure will build up. You have to decompress your ears, pop them, open up your mouth, swallow, etc. drink water, there are ways to help clear your ears. Now, as far as people who shouldn't get into a chamber, the first, the, the most, the only absolute contraindication, the only person that shouldn't get into a chamber absolutely is somebody that has what's called a tension pneumothorax, somebody that has a drop lung, and they should be in a hospital. So sometimes we'll see these kinds of people in the hospital for acute reasons for hyperbaric therapy, but those guys and women can't get into the hyperbaric chamber. The second person that's mostly uh, not allowed is, is if you're pregnant. And because again, we don't like to do things on pregnant women. Um, however, pregnancy in, in Russia and actually in the US as well, they've used hyperbaric therapy on pregnant females, pregnant women, of course, um, in carbon monoxide poisoning and the, the kids are fine. But in general, if you're pregnant, you can't get into a hyperbaric chamber. And then there becomes what, what we call the relative contraindications, the reasons why you may, want, may not want to get into a chamber. And a lot of this has to do with the severity of illness and the type of chamber that you're gonna be using. You know, mild chambers overall, less pressure, less oxygen, you know, overall less complications just in general. But if you have a history of um, uncontrolled heart disease, if you, have it, if you have a heart function that's low, if you have uncontrolled pulmonary disease, or you have pulmonary disorders that, that have these various aspects that, that make it difficult to, for you to, to get oxygen in the system, whether it be COPD or, or it could be pulmonary fibrosis, et cetera, uh, you don't wanna get into a chamber. Um, and if you have uncontrolled asthma, you don't wanna get into a chamber either because the lungs are really important and can get more reactive in the chambers as well. If you have basically un uncontrolled anything, it could be difficult in the chamber, but especially heart, lung, and brain. So if you have uncontrolled seizure disorder, you don't want to get into a chamber. At higher oxygen levels and higher pressures or deeper pressures, there is a, a higher risk to have a seizure in the chamber. But we have various ways of mitigating that at the deeper pressures. Instead of getting all the oxygen the entire time, you get what are called air breaks. So you break that up every 20 or 30 minutes, you breathe just the air in the chamber, or you get a mask that gives you sea level air. And 
it decreases the risk. And we actually think that might be, there might be therapeutic potential there as well, interestingly enough, with that change in going from 100% oxygen to 21%, because the body sees that as a relative hypoxia and releases same, some of the same things that you would see if you were uh, at altitude. So like hypoxic inducible factor, for example. But anyway, so we use it as a, mostly as an air break for oxygen toxicity, and that can really manifest in the brain as seizures, very rare. There are certain medications that can decrease your seizure threshold, so we have to be careful of those as well. Um, but again, very rare. Uh, pulmonary toxicity is very rare if you don't have any lung conditions, but you need to screen those out. Uh, often people that are about 60 years of age or older, and they're going into a medical grade chamber, we recommend getting a chest x-ray to make sure everything looks clear. Um, but this is why it's important to, to speak to somebody that knows what they're doing and not just, yeah, the, the, the mild chambers are great for everything. Just get in, it's gonna be fine. Or that one chamber is gonna change your life, or sorry, one treatment is gonna change your life. I have some clinics that I work with across the country that use them as like, like for oxygen naps. You can take a nap in oxygen for 30 minutes and you do feel quite good after you take a nap. I will say that, but it's not gonna be therapeutic you know, over the long-term. That's more of like a short-term kind of one-off thing. Mm -hmm. So it's really important. This is a medical therapy. It's not something that you should think use as, as something that like a one-off, like, oh, I'll just get into the chamber and, and see how I do. It's like, do it intentionally and do it with, with an idea of what you're looking to, you know, to gain from it. Let's look at your personal story. How many times are you on the chamber? Which chamber are you in? And do you use it preventively as an anti-aging tool? So I have, I have a mild unit myself, but I live in a small house in California, in San Francisco. So it's not in my house. It's actually at a friend's house, um, biohacker house, actually, funny enough. And so they have a lot of tools and things in there. So I go there regularly. Um, I go to the hard chambers when I need them. You know, if I've, I've, I gave myself a concussion several years ago. I did the whole thing. I went into the chamber. I did my hyperbaric concussion protocol. I did my supplements, had dietary changes, and I felt fantastic after three days. It wasn't a severe concussion. It was a mild concussion, but I use the chamber more in a precision way in the sense of when I need the chamber, I use the chamber. Um, but there are also reasons to do it more in like a protocol of 20, 30, 40 sessions to get those epigenetic changes to shift over. And um, those are important as well. Right. So how many times are you in the mild chamber, whether you've, you know, you told me about your story of the concussion, yes, and supplements and program and, you know, you know, the, the, the hard chamber, are you using it preventively twice or three times a week, a mild hyperbaric chamber? Currently for me, I'll use it maybe once a week, you know, as, okay. as a mild preventative, but I don't, I don't have any acute indications for using the chamber, right? It would be more for like the optimization. And, you know, honestly, I would use it more if I could, but it's not in my house at the moment. Okay. So, so um, if it was in yeah. your house, how many yeah. times would you use it? So if it was in my house, I would be using it about two or three times a week. And I okay. would have done a, a protocol uh, that would have been more of a, um, a block of therapy to start off with, typically 20, 30, 40 sessions, maybe six days, five to six days out of the week. And to get that block, and then you use it, um, then you use it like once or twice, three times a week, depending on what you need. And then you try to tailor it to what else you're doing in your life. Are you taking a flight? Are you, are you exercising heavier? And so like I have an athlete of mine now, She's, a, she's gonna be trying out for the Olympics in Japan in a couple months. And she's been, like she had an injury, for example, of her Achilles tendon. She had an Achilles tendon sprain, it was swollen. So what we did is she was getting a hyperbaric protocol. And then while she was in the chamber, she was also doing electric stimulation of the particular area. And instead of healing in four or six weeks, she healed in two. And so, okay. uh, and so we're using the chamber in, in that way as well. So um, for, again, it just depends on what your goals are, what you're looking to do. And there's, there's different ways to use chambers and different protocols. So, Fantastic. Uh, I do want to find out about, is there a white paper about, you know, the indications for mild hyperbaric oxygen therapy and the dangers and the risks that people can go to a website or an organization mm. in the US that people can get some information or, you know, obviously they can, they're going to Google, we'll put your links of where you're at in terms of all the podcasts and listening to you. But is, are there some sort of, you know, documentation that people can have a look at? Not yet. <laughs> not yet. Okay. No, there's nothing, nothing comprehensive. I mean, there are certainly, I did an article on Ben Greenfield's blog a little yeah. while ago. That's pretty comprehensive as far as talking about the delineation. That's probably where I would send most people that are interested in, in a pretty, it's a pretty deep dive. I mean, I, I it's a long article and I, I spent a lot of time on it to try to help educate the biohacking community on how to use these various different types of chambers and what they should be looking for in various mm. facilities. So that's probably the best place, but I think from like a more technical research side of things, like that doesn't exist right now. I mean, and there's a couple of websites uh, that I can send people to. Um, there's a one that's called Hyperbaric Experts, 
hyperbarecexperts.com. That's run by one of my colleagues. And that it does a pretty good job uh, keeping track of all the studies that have been done in mild hyperbaric environments. And, there's, uh, and there are my colleagues in New York, Boston, and Florida, uh, that the Hyperbaric Medical Solutions Company. And it's hyperbaricmedicalsolutions.com, or I think it's hmshbot.com. And they have a really good list of research and data for all the heart chamber indications, both the uh, insurance approved along with the investigational as well. So those are the places that I would go for the research. Um, and the places that I would go for kind of putting it all together would be my, my article. But I'm working on some other stuff too, but it's not quite ready. Cool, because I think it would be great to have some type of organization, some type of association that would be very beneficial for, to check out all these companies to give recommendations, because I think that the person out on the street is really not sure. He's really not sure about what's yeah. happening. And then you get the other side of the continuum saying what I, what I read to you, that there's no indications, it's, right. you know, and you, it's dangerous, it's risky, mm -hmm. it's not, should, mm -hmm. it shouldn't be used, you know, only medical grade at uh, specific. So I think we do need to sort of educate and put something in place, you know, and obviously we've, mm -hmm. we're a little bit behind in SA, but that would be great uh, for the future. Last yeah, question, I mean, where, yeah, go for it. I, I agree. That's all yeah. I was going to say. Where is HBOT going in the future? Where do you see it going? I mean, they're starting to spring up more in South Africa, although the costs are quite exorbitant because it's not made locally. Where do you see HBOT in, say, five, 10 years' time? Well, it's a good question. And it's actually exciting, I think. The Israelis are the largest, I think, contingent of, of people right now. There is a company called, I think called the Aviv Clinics, they're calling themselves. Based out of Israel, it's, uh, it's out of Tel Aviv. And, and they have these large multi-place chambers. So these are chambers that you can fit multi multiple people at the same time. And they're setting up these anti-aging clinics around the world. They have one, they just, I think, opened up in Dubai. They have one in Florida. Um, and they're really raising the level of visibility of how hyperbaric therapy can be used in a anti-aging or, or, or as uh, Dr. Shai Afradi, their medical director, who I know will call it reverse aging. Mm -hmm. And there was a study they published not too long ago on senescent cell populations and telomere length increasing, telomere length increasing senescent pop populations going down inside of a hyperbaric environment, that, that that's what they're doing. So there's there's been a lot more interest in hyperbaric therapy for those sort of optimization strategies related to reverse aging. And so I think that's just only going to grow. I think also the mild chamber market is growing very fast and it's exciting, but very concerning at the same time for me because of the lack of uh, lack of regulation, as you said, and also the this, the lack of um, stability in the sense of how people are getting suggested to use these chambers and for what indications. And so it's been that's been one of my jobs, as I know, as it's been growing. And so I have a company called HBOT Plus, which is a company based out of Australia, mostly, and then myself in the U.S. that's trying to create um, education for people on how to use the chambers more safely. And so we're going to be coming out with a phone application that'll be built in with education and, and wellness programs for the mild units overall. And then we're coming out with new technology to help with, you were asking this before, but pressure sensing, oxygen sensing, and also different types of protocols that we've started to create to see if we can modulate pressures in a different way to help with them being more therapeutic at the milder levels. And so I have significant interest in, in seeing hyperbaric therapy go in a way that allows people to be educated in what chambers would be best for them. And then also how you can in integrate these things with the other things that you're doing in your life, whether it be health optimization medicine, whether it's all the fancy gadgets that you have in your home, and whether it be other, uh, wh wh other things that you're doing if you're getting cancer treated, or if you're doing, if you have a severe injury or whatever, there's lots of different ways you can use hyperbaric therapy in the context. But again, it's about finding the framework. I have my framework that I think works, works very well and then and trying to give that framework out there in as many ways as possible so fantastic last question for dr scott thank you so much for your time is i've interviewed uh, sort of 50 guests already i've been doing health coaching executive coaching for the last 15 years changed a lot of people's lives through facilitation and consultations what i find most frustrating over the last 22 years is that often people put things in place they optimize their health and three months later six months later a year later five years later they're back to their old ways that do not continue with the hacks. They don't continue with the lifestyle changes and they fall back and they only wait until they get sick. And Naval Ravikant, one of my favorite VCs out there in the US said, suffering is the seed of change. If people are gonna maintain their transformations, Dr. Scott, give us your three top pieces of advice, how people can maintain their transformation. That's a great question. That's a really great question. 
there's lots of ways to, I mean, to answer that because of course I've been in the same boat for all of my years of practice too. People get very motivated initially and then they lose steam. They get to their new normal and then they forget how they felt before and they get off the wagon and then they have to come back on the wagon. It's, it's sort of human nature. And the idea really is how can you create daily practices that are relatively easy for people to be able to maintain even a modicum of, of the stability in the sense of creating those cornerstone habits in the, in the way. So my idea with people is to try to continue to emphasize those cornerstone habits, whether it's, and they're very simple most of the time. Usually it's meditation, exercise, and sleep. If you can work on either those three things, and then if the, the fourth one would be relationships as well. If you can maintain and, and sort of work on those things every day, even some small amount, um, oftentimes you can be a lot more stable in your progress and oftentimes a lot more stable in your, in your optimization strategies. If you just do that, because we, get, we all get distracted by the pretty little shiny object, like the squirrel there, like you know, all these new technologies. And then you, you forget about the, the stuff that's most important. You're like, how are your relationships at home? Are you meditating? Are you taking time to exercise? Um, are you getting time to yourself and nature? You know, it's the, it's the, the simple things that I try to emphasize as being the things that are the most important. And then if you're doing those things, oftentimes we're more successful. So that, I think it's, it's, it's sticking with the basics. If you can stick with the basics on a daily basis, oftentimes your job and my job is easier because the compliance becomes a lot easier over time. Fantastic. And uh, just tell the audience and the viewers where they can connect with you, where they can find out more information, how they can listen to more podcasts, because I'm sure this is going to intrigue a lot of interest, you know, with the community I made to thrive in South Africa and Africa. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So on Instagram, it's at Dr. Scott Scher, my name, D-R-S-C-O-T-T-S-H-E-R-R. -T -T -E I also have my website, integrativehbot.com, and my, which is part of my hbot.plus uh, dot plus website as well. So it's hbot.plus is the website for my, for my hyperbaric company. Those are the main places. And I do worldwide consultation education on hyperbaric therapy. So I speak to people all across the world. I speak to clinics all across the world. And I help them optimize their hyperbaric environment, their, their protocols, their integrations. And I, it's what I really enjoy doing. And so I, I do it all across the world, just not in the middle of my evening. And so, you know, there's a bit of a time thing sometimes in, in South Africa and other places, but we can usually make it work. So I'm happy to do that as well, if that's something that, that, you, that people are interested in, because my goal really is education. And so yeah. I, my favorite people to work with are clinics, because that's where I can educate the best sort of node in the system to get more people on the same page of what we're doing. So. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Scott Scher, he is the hyperbaric oxygen therapy specialist expert. I declare favor and blessing over you that you would thrive in your calling and your purpose to go and educate the world so that people can actually transform their lives, and live out the purposes that they were created. Dr. Scott Scher, thank you so much. An absolute health hero. Go and check him out. He's a true health legend. He's doing this to transform people's lives. And I'm so grateful for you. And I honor you. And I trust that you will just live out your goals, your dreams. I know you've got an incredible family. We haven't got into your family. You speak of your family. I've listened to a lot of your podcasts. So thank you so much. Ditto, Steve.